know what I was thinking about as we were singing that, that hymn? It's so easy when you come to church and you've got a mask on or you're sitting at home watching a service to choose not to sing. But you know what? I was thinking, if God, if God were sitting on his throne right here in our choir loft, and he said, sing me a song, would the mask matter? Would the fact that you're watching online matter? No. You'd sing a song of praise to God because you love him. And you want, you want him to know it. So when you sing, try to imagine that. God sitting on his throne here in Sunset Road and telling you, I want you to sing me a song. Because you know what? The Bible says where two or more are present in his name, he is with us. So he is here wanting to hear us sing to him and give him praise. Well, we want to share a few prayer concerns this morning. Uh, we want to continue to remember Tammy Roberts. Tammy, I believe, if memory serves me correct, your, your PET scan is next week, this week, right? Tuesday. So be sure to say an extra prayer for Tammy on Tuesday as she has this PET scan done. We also want to pray for Martha Griffin. And uh, I talked to her in the end of last week, but Bobby, can you give me an update? Thank you, Bobby. Uh, if you could not hear, uh, Bobby was saying that uh, Martha is doing better. Uh, she's still got some pain. She's recuperating from that. Uh, she is, uh, if you had tried to reach her, uh, her phone had not been working, but it is working now, and she would very much appreciate some phone calls of encouragement. So Martha, if you're watching this morning, we love you and we're praying for you. We also want to pray for Dave McDonald. He's continuing to recover at home. Uh, also, we want to pray for uh, Francis Mueller, Nina's father, and uh, how, is, how is he doing this morning, or the, most recently? Um, it's not that great. I got to um, FaceTime with him yesterday. Yes. Um, and he's really fading out fast. Okay. So I don't know if it's the morphine. I think it is. I don't know, but he, you know, he didn't, wasn't doing too good yesterday. Okay. If you could not hear Nina, she was saying that her father was beginning to slip away, but she had a chance to talk to him on FaceTime this week, uh, th yesterday to be exact. Uh, Mr. Mueller is in his late to mid-90s, and so he had a, a very significant surgery a few weeks ago, so keep him in your prayers. I also want to pray for Shirley Goodrum, and I think I saw Gary earlier. Gary? Yeah, there you are. How's, how's she doing today? She's doing, she's uh, had a couple of good days in a row, and uh, she's got some appetite back. So, Shirley, if you're watching, we, we love you, and we're praying for you. And Dave, same thing. I know you and Marie watch, so we're praying for you as well. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Wayne and Barbara Helderman. Uh, I'm sure they're probably watching this morning today as well. We love you. Uh, pray for Warren Duncan, Shirley's husband. Warren, if you're watching, uh, we send our love and prayers to you as well. Uh, continue to pray for Joey Ship, Pam's brother, as he recovers from one surgery and faces several more. Uh, continue to pray for Glenda Saunders, uh, Eva's, Eva Warren Staff's daughter, who, will soon, who has uh, begun her treatments for cancer. Uh, continue to pray for Sandy Alford, uh, Tammy, Tammy Roberts' niece. Uh, also pray for Christina Baker, Kelly Carroll's friend. And pray for our pastor search committee. Uh, they have begun to meet, and we need to keep them much in your prayers. That needs to be at the top of your prayer list because that, that group of members that you have called out are going to be the ones who will search out and find, discover, let's put it discover, the next person that God intends to serve as pastor of Sunset Road Baptist Church. So keep them in your prayers. Well, we, right now we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, yes, thank you, Julie. I'm sorry. 
They took who did hospice? Jean Ramosi. I'm, I'm sorry. So Jean. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, if you did not hear that, Jean Ryan was taken to the hospital yesterday uh, and spent the night uh, overnight. And Jean, if you're able to watch, we love you and we're praying for you as well. Any others that I may have overlooked or, or missed? Yes. We sure will remember. We'll, we'll remember Ben, who has uh, come down with COVID-19. So it's getting better, but people are still getting sick. So we need to be praying for for everyone. Anybody else? All right. Well, Audrey, are you prepared to play a little bit for us as we go to the Lord in prayer? I know I just threw it on you right now. We'll give you a moment to. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today because we love you. And we, the reason we love you is that you loved us first. You loved us best. You created us, and then when we made the decision to sin against you, you made the decision to send Jesus to this earth, your Son, so that he could die on the cross and pay the penalty that our sin merited. Father, that is as basic as Christianity gets, except for something we cannot forget. And that is that Jesus also was raised from the dead three days after his death. He was victorious over the grave, and he is the first fruits of them that sleep. Father, how can we tell you how much we love you? And as we approach this Easter season, help us to celebrate the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we have mentioned those who are sick. Father, we also want to continue to pray for those who have recently lost loved ones. Father, no matter what the situation, one thing is, is the same. and That is, these folks need you. We're not telling you anything that you don't already know. In fact, Father, I can confidently say that because of your grace, you have already begun to work in these folks' lives. But Father, help them also to know that we are praying for them. Father, we ask you to continue to watch over us as we worship together this morning. Father, we pray that already, our hearts, our minds, our all is focused on you and you alone. Father, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
in America deserves a vacation. I think it's Dr. Anthony Fauci. The man is 80 years old, and he never stops. I don't think he's taken a day off in a year. And judging from his television appearances, he starts his morning very early, and he doesn't stop until late in the evening. I don't know how a person 50 years younger could keep up with the pace that he's setting. That's why during this pandemic, Dr. Fauci has become one of my personal heroes. He is earnestly trying to eliminate this plague that's in our midst, while patiently, honestly, and persistently telling people what they need to do to keep from getting sick and avoid dying. And that must get exhausting. I'm serious. The problem is there's still a lot of people who are not listening to the things that Dr. Fauci is saying. They still will not wear face masks. They are not maintaining social distance. They are not washing their hands, at least the way they should. They are not getting a vaccination. They are convinced that COVID is either either isn't real, or that God will protect them from this deadly disease. Which sort of reminds me of a funny story. Seems a man once owned a house that was located very close to a river, and record amounts of rain had been falling, causing the river to begin to flood. So the police started going door to door, 
They told the man, you need to get out right now because your house is going to flood. The man was rocking on his porch. And he said, oh, no, I don't need to worry about that. I've been praying, and God is going to take care of me. So he stayed put. But the rain kept raining, and the, the river kept rising, and the floods crept closer and closer to his house. Finally, his street was flooded, and firefighters came floating down the man's stream in, boat, in, in front of his house, came floating down the street in a boat, and told him, get in the boat. You need to get out right now. But the man just nodded his head and said, no, 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 no. I've prayed about this thing, and God is going to take care of me. Unfortunately, the rains kept falling, the river kept rising, the flood kept inching closer and closer until finally it was inside the first story of his house and then the second story of the house. And finally, the man had to get up on on the roof to avoid the floods. And about that time he got climbed out on the roof, a helicopter came flying over him. And they lowered one of those rescue baskets down. And they said, climb in and we'll pull you to safety. The man went, oh, no, 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 I'm not worried. I prayed about it. And God's going to take care of me. But the rain kept falling. The river kept rising, the floods overwhelmed his house, and pretty soon the man died, and he went to heaven. And when he got there, he was furious with God. Lord, I prayed about the flood. I expected you to protect me. God replied, what more did you want? I sent the police and the fire department and the helicopter to rescue you, and you would not listen. It is dangerous not to listen when you get a very solemn warning. Which brings me back to Paul. In the 21st chapter of Acts, we see Paul ignoring a lot of warnings about his plan to visit Jerusalem. Repeatedly, he told that going to Jerusalem was, going, was dangerous, possibly even deadly. But nothing could shake Paul's determination to make one more visit to Jerusalem. In today's message, I want us to look at some of those message warnings that Paul received and discover why he was so determined to fulfill his plan to go to Jerusalem. So turn with me to Acts chapter 21. We're going to pick up the story in the first verse. Acts 21, verse 1. Notice what the Bible says here. After we had torn ourselves away from them. Now Paul, who was one of... uh, of of Luke's, excuse me, Luke, who was one of Paul's missionary companions, is talking about Paul's experience with the leaders of the Ephesian church. During his visit, Paul had told them that none of you will ever see me again, knowing that this was going to be the last time they would ever lay eyes on Paul had a powerful impact on these men. So notice what it goes on to say, let's skip down to Acts chapter, look at, well, let's go back and look at what it says in Acts chapter 20, verses 36 through 38. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. You know, the other day I was thinking about my last Sunday at New Sandy Creek Baptist Church. After the service, Pam and the kids went ahead and left, going to coming to Charlotte, and I stayed behind to make sure everything was packed away the way it should. And when I got when I was all along in that parsonage, I started crying like a baby. Now don't get me wrong, I was excited about coming to Sunset Road, but the finality of that moment unleashed a torrent of emotions inside of me. Well, if you multiply that by, I don't know, a factor of what, a thousand? You begin to get an idea about what the Ephesian elders were feeling that day. They loved Paul deeply and passionately. In many cases, he was the one who led them to Christ. They couldn't imagine a world in which they would never see him again. But then it got worse. Paul started telling them that 
he fully expected to be killed for the sake of Jesus. They couldn't handle it. And like people tend to do in situations like this, the Ephesian elders wanted to wrap their arms around him and protect Paul, to keep him safe with them. Notice what it says. Acts chapter 21, verse 1. After we had torn ourselves away from them, the Greek words here indicate a very volatile situation. People desperately clinging to Paul. Don't go. Stay here with us where it's safe. And Paul struggling to pull away, insisting that the time had come for him to go to Jerusalem. Okay, let's pick up the story, verses 1 through 4. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Chios. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patura. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing, passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre where our ship was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there. Now as we've learned throughout this sermon series, Paul's missionary strategy never, never varied. Whenever he would arrive in a new city, he would find a Jewish synagogue. Then he would go there to worship on the first Sabbath, knowing full well that because he was dressed in, in rabbinic robes that he would be called upon to speak to the people. And then he would take that opportunity to proclaim the gospel message about Jesus. Then, following the inevit inevitable backlash, Paul would perform a ritual of shaking his garments clean of these folks, and he would begin to share the gospel with the wider Gentile community. But I want you to notice something. This didn't happen here in Tyre. Instead of looking for a Jewish congregation, Paul and Luke and his missionary companions were went looking for the Christians who were already in the city. Now this tells us two things. First of all, it tells us that the church entire was successfully sharing the good news about Jesus with their community. The fact is, missionary evangelists like Paul and Luke were not necessary and have never been necessary if a local church fulfills its great commission to share the gospel of Jesus. But here in Acts 21, verses 1 through 4, something else is going on here. Paul is following the Holy Spirit's agenda for his life. Tyre was not his final destination. Jesus didn't need to have a new church planted in that city. Tyre was just a pit stop on the journey to Jerusalem. But then something wonderful happened. Paul and Luke were able to find a like-minded, spirit-filled group of believers and they were able to enjoy a week's worth of vacation. It was a time of fellowship and rejoicing in one another's presence, which points out another important truth that we, you and I need to learn, and that is, as Christians, you need fellowship with other Christians. Now, granted, you cannot share the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost person unless you know some lost people, so you can't spend all your time with Christians. You have to develop those friendships that will enable you to talk about Jesus. But do not forget, you will always need fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Having genuine Christian fellowship is a part of God's plan for your life. It helps build you up and strengthens you and encourages you to live a life that is productive and pleasing to God. So if for any reason at all you ha ever happen to move away from Charlotte, and we've had a lot of people move away from Charlotte in the last 15 years or so, don't cling to your church membership here. As important as Sunset Road Baptist Church may be to you. Instead, find a local church where you can worship God and fellowship with Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christians. All right, let's look again at verse 4. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven weeks. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. 
Okay. Here's where we need a big time out. Because this is one of the most intriguing verses of Scripture you will find in the entire Bible. On the one hand, the Bible clearly says that the Holy Spirit had instructed Paul to go to Jerusalem regardless of the dangers that that he faced. But God's Word also says the Christian's entire, speaking under the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit, urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. So what are we supposed to make of this? Have we got some sort of contradiction here, or or is is there some misunderstanding going on? Well, after a lot of praying and study, I've, I've come up with several possibilities here. One possibility is that Paul simply did not believe that his new friends were speaking the truth of God. He may have thought, I'm sure their hearts are in the right place. But this can't be the Holy Spirit speaking through them. Their emotions must be getting the best of them. But there's only one problem with that theory. The Greek, again, the Greek words that are used here is all, are always used to refer to someone who is genuinely proclaiming the truth of God under the direction of the Holy Spirit. That rules that theory out right away. A second possibility is that the Holy Spirit had ordered Paul to change his plans. Listen to what these people are saying, not what you heard before. But if that's the case, you have to say that Paul went on to sin against God because he continued on to Jerusalem, which makes no sense whatsoever because Paul was not the kind of person who deliberately disobeyed God. Here's what really happened in Acts chapter 21, verse 4. The Holy Spirit needed the Christians entire to reveal what Paul faced in Jerusalem. Paul's friends understood this revelation as a direct warning from God. Don't go. Stay here where it's safe. But Paul interpreted these words to be a ref. A, a confirmation of the warnings that he had already received. Paul knew that he was going to face persecution, imprisonment, and possibly even death in Jerusalem. But that didn't matter. Listen to what he told the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and 24. Remember, remember the Ephesian elders? However, I consider myself, my life worth nothing to me, My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. You know, Paul's experience in Tyre had some important implications for Christians today. Even if someone comes along and claims to have a direct revelation from the Holy Spirit, God expects you to use the mind and the spiritual discernment that he's given you to correctly interpret what is being said. In 1 John 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This idea of testing the spirits means you put the claim of special revelation to the test. Ask yourself, does this message change the gospel good news about Jesus Christ in any way, make, shape, or form? If it does, it's not from God. Does this revelation contradict anything that is taught in the pages of God's perfect, infallible word? Because if it does, it is not from God. Have you been following the the news about the QAnon conspiracy and something called Christian nationalism? Among other things, QAnon conspirators have been taught that Q is a prophet that's sending out messages that should be considered sacred texts, virtually on the same level as the Bible. Q claims that former President Donald Trump 
is a messianic figure chosen by God who will conjure an apocalyptic, apocalyptic battle called the storm, which will bring about the kingdom of God here on earth, centered in an, om, om, omnip, in, excuse me, centered in an omnipotent, theocratic United States. Christian nationalists, nationalists go a little bit further. They say that the United States has replaced Israel as the chosen people of God, and that the United States must reclaim its status as a Christian nation, a nation which under Christian, Christian nationalist teaching is created for the benefit of white men, to be ruled by white men. The sad thing is that there are, peop there are people, including a lot of evangelical Christians, who believe this this. I'm not even going to use the word that I want to use here. These lies have to be confronted and exposed for the heretical, despicable, evil work of Satan. And it starts when you pick up a Bible and you discover the perfect truth of God. That's how you overcome that nonsense. Look, here's the bottom line. God has given you a brain. He's given you spiritual discernment through the Holy Spirit. He expects you to use these things. Let's read on what it says in verses 5 through 9, Acts 21. When it was time to leave, leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and land in it, landed in Ptolemais, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. This means he was one of the original seven disciples that the Jerusalem church chose. He was, oh, by, the way, by the way, one other thing he did, he, he was also the one who led the Ethiopian eunuch to a saving relationship with Jesus. So this is a pretty important guy. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. You know, I do not know why the Holy Spirit led Luke to mention that Philip, about something about Philip's daughters. But again, it points out an important biblical truth. In the early church, listen to me, in the early church, women had important leadership roles, including preaching, teaching, and evangelism. Now here's where I need to explain what the spiritual gift of prophecy meant in the New Testament. It was not about foretelling the future. The gift of prophecy existed for the foretelling of God's love the truth of the gospel as it is presented in God's holy word. That's what prophecy was about. Today we have a word to describe this gift. We call it preaching. Okay? As long as the preacher is rightly dividing the word of God and proclaiming the name of Jesus. If he's just going on and on about his opinions or about, about current events, that's not preaching. Now, this is, this is a fact. And this fact confronts churches that do not allow women to have leadership roles in their congregation. These churches are choosing to ignore the truth of the Bible. These guys, and they're almost always male pastors and deacons, may choose to worship the false idol of sexism and misogyny but their choice directly contradicts the perfect word of God. Verse 10. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, or Jerusalem. Now, if you're a biblical trivia expert, you probably know this is the second time that Agabus appears in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 28, the Bible says, during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. 
Folks, there's no doubt that God gives some believers the ability, the gift of foretelling the future. It's happened from time to time in the Bible, and there's no reason to think that it will not continue to happen in the church. But again, if someone claims to have a revelation from God that predicts the future, it's time to take a deep breath, then get out your Bible and discover what God's Word says. A good guideline here is found in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Uh, Paul has been preaching to the Bereans, and, and it says, Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. For the Berean Jews, Paul was preaching a message they'd never heard of, a message that seemed to contradict a good bit of what they'd always been taught. But they didn't reject it out of hand. Instead, they carefully studied the Bible to see if Paul's message of Christ and him crucified was true. Look, if someone claims that they have a, a revelation from God, especially about the second coming of Jesus or the end of times, it's best to stay highly skeptical of those claims and test that claim against the perfect, infallible truth of God's Word. Pick it up again at verse 10. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judah. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles kind of dramatic stuff, isn't it? What would happen if, if something like that would happen in our church this morning? I don't even want to talk about it right now. But, but here's the thing. Agabus' action actually had a, an Old Testament basis. There was something going on in the Old Testament that led him to, do, to, to follow the Holy Spirit's leadership in this matter. In Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, listen to what the Bible says. Now, son of man, take a block of clay, put it in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it. Okay, Build a model of Jerusalem in your house, and then once that model, begin to attack it. Erect siege works against it. Build a ramp up to it. Set up camps against it. And put battering rams around it. All right. Then take an iron pan, Place it as an iron wall between you and the city and turn your face toward it. It will be under siege and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the people of Israel. I think a sign that, that Ezekiel's gone crazy. You know? Then, it goes on. Then lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, more than a year, you're supposed to lay on your side bearing the sins of Israel. After you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days, a year for each day, year, a day for each year. Turn your face toward the siege of Jerusalem and with bared arms prophesy against her. So in, the pro so, so in your house, go up to the model of Jerusalem that you have created and, lay, and, and prophes leave, stretch out your hand and begin to prophesy against it. I will tie you up with ropes so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have found the day, finished the days of your siege. <laughs> you know they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, with, with all, well, if that's true, then Ezekiel's bizarre behavior must have been worth millions of words. He was acting out the truth that God had proclaimed His holy judgment on the people of Israel. Agabus's actions served a similar purpose. God was revealing His truth. Paul was in mortal danger if he insisted on going to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were Paul, at this point I might want to rethink this whole idea of going to the holy city. 
God appeared to be closing a lot of doors, didn't he? I mean, it's like the story I told you at the beginning of the sermon. How many warnings do you get before you decide something just isn't worth it? At the very least, Paul's desire to go to Jerusalem wasn't being made any easier given the advice he was receiving from his friends. But notice what Paul says in verse 12. When we heard this, meaning Agabus' message, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. By this point, even Luke was asking Paul to reconsider his plans. When I was in seminary, I had a professor named Dr. Robert Culpepper. He was an outstanding Christian man. He had served as a missionary to Japan for many years before becoming a professor at the seminary. Well, he once told us a story. He says that when he was growing up, his mother was a leader in the Women's, Mission, women's Missionary Union, the WMU, in her church. Every month, the women would meet, and they would pray, spend their time praying, that God would call young people to go overseas to share the good news about Jesus. Now, given all of that, Dr. Culpepper says, I was convinced that my mother would be thrilled when I told her that I had accepted God's call to go to the mission field. He said, I told her, Mama, your prayers have been answered. God is at calling me to be a missionary in Japan. She looked at him with a stern face and she said, Bob, I never had mentioned, I never meant for God to call you. One of the most difficult things a Christian can do is to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in the face of numerous obstacles, countless warnings, and strong objections from family and friends. But it's clear Paul never wavered in his determination to obey God's call on his life. Notice what it says in verse 13. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Where did Paul get this kind of courage? From the one who died on the cross for him. Jesus had gone to Jerusalem knowing full well what he would face there. Rejection and denial by his closest friends. Arrest, a sham trial, and severe beatings at the hands of the Roman soldiers the physical torture of the cross, the spiritual agony of being separated from his heavenly daddy God, and a sacrificial death for the sin of the world, for your sin and my sin. To Paul, it was a simple proposition. If Jesus loves me that much, I will gladly and willingly lay down everything for him. You'll have your Bibles with you. Turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, I want, you to re- I want us to read verses 7 through 14 where Paul talks about this a little bit more. Notice what he says. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already obtained this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So I wonder, Are any of you feeling a call to do something for Jesus today? 
If that is true, don't worry about the obstacles. Don't listen to the warnings. Don't surrender in the face of objection from family and friends. Instead, be like Paul. Be like Isaiah, who answered God boldly and courageously, Here I am, Lord. Use me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship that we've experienced today. Thank you, Father, for pouring out your love on us in powerful ways. Father, we have sung your praise. We have prayed down heaven's blessing. We've listened as the word of God was proclaimed this morning. And Father, now people will make decisions. If someone has never accepted Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord, perhaps the day has come for them to do what Tyler has already done. And that is, accept Jesus as your Savior and follow him in believer's baptism. And so if there's someone either here in the sanctuary or, or, or watching online who's ready to ask Jesus to be their Savior, I hope that they'll pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are God's one and only Son. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me because I'm a sinner. Jesus, I believe that you were physically raised from the dead three days after your death on the cross. Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I invite you to come into my life and be my personal Savior and forever friend. Father, if someone's prayed that prayer today or, or just, just nodded as I was praying the prayer, then today is their day of salvation. And if they're here in the sanctuary, I pray they'll come forward after the worship is over and speak to me. If they're watching online, I pray they'll send me a, mess, a, a message at the email address shown on the screen. Father, there may be others here today who, who've been wrestling with some sort of call on their life that you've, you've, you've made. Perhaps it's, it's to, to teach a Sunday school or, 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 to, or to work here on some uh, committee or organization here in the church. Perhaps, Father, it's, to, it's to, 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 to get involved in the wider community, sharing your good news and, and taking your love out into the world. Perhaps, Father, it is someone who, who's being called to be a pastor or or called to be a missionary. Father, whatever decision needs to be made, I, I pray that they will say yes to Jesus, just like Paul did, just like Elijah did. And Father, we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.